All right. And it's up to you guys if you want to wait a few minutes to see if other people show up or we can do it, go ahead and get started, whatever you guys feel like. I would think it is up to you, Miss D. Mahal, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Maybe one more minute. Um, it is the mid the midweek drudge. I, you know, like people are grabbing coffee. Maybe they're turning on their phones, they're in their commute. So a little extra effort. And plus, I don't know about you, but the weather over here is really cozy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just making everything slower. So <laughs> probably 45 more seconds will be good. Yeah, I left campus at 4.30 and normally there's not any traffic at 4.30, but today it was, it was already sluggish. Yes, and welcome, welcome. I see Jean, Kay, and Matthew. Welcome. Thank you, Mahal. I was trying to figure out how to unmute to say thank you. So thank you. <laughs> Yay, thanks for awesome. joining us, Kay. <laughs> Pretty good. Where are you based, Kay? I'm actually Sam Blanchard's wife. We are in Tulsa. Oh, um, so I met you. I met you at the yes, you party. Yes, at the yeah. little party. Hey. I remember you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna go back on mute now. <laughs> okay. Okay. No problem. Always great to, to have support, which is actually one of my questions later. So it's great. Um, yeah, I think we're good. I'm warmed up. I've had half a, half a grande of coffee, so let's get to it. All right. Welcome to Global Entrepreneurship Week, and this is the Entrepreneurship and Tech panel, and my name is Mahal Ramos. My pronouns are she and her, and I will be the moderator for this session. Thank you to um, Diana and, of course, Declama for coordinating this event. We also want to thank our sponsors, Heartland Payment Systems and the Global Entrepreneurship Network. We also want to give a special shout out to Kristen Garcia. She is the state coordinator of Oklahoma. Though she's not on this call, we do want to give her credit where credit's due, because without her, this wouldn't be possible. I am looking forward to this session and with um, those on the call and even those who watch this on demand to just remind us of the te of Techlahoma's code of conduct. And we value that our events are informative and people you feel safe and welcome and ready to learn. And we just wanna be able to keep it that way. So if at any point, um, in any of our events, you experience or witness anything that is not aligned with our code of conduct, please let us know. Um, as I've heard leaders at other events put it, just be awesome to one another and, and we'll be good. Um, and so we are a smaller group in this session, so feel free to, to um, uh, put your questions in the chat or even just unmute yourself. We do want this to be accessible and interactive for you. Um, and also, um, if you are just more comfortable, you can also put your questions in the chat and we can call on you. Um, if that's a little easier, then you can ask them directly. And I am so thankful for this amazing panel that we have on. Uh, so uh, for those of you, if this is your first time, be ready to take notes and ask your questions. We have Devin Mobley, consultant, tech entrepreneur, and board member of the Techlahoma Foundation. We also have Sam Blanchard, uncommon project manager and founder of our project experience. And we also have Patrick Almond, who's a veteran professional keynote speaker and digital marketing expert. Now these descriptions are actually rather shortened because <laughs> these individuals are multi-dimensional, multi-talented. So I will let that come out uh, for their stories. Uh, so speaking of that, uh, let's start off with the first question and we'll just popcorn it off. But Devin, if you wouldn't mind starting, and the question is, what was the defining moment or series of events that led you to entrepreneurship? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thank you all for having me. Um, so entrepreneurship, the defining moment for me was when my 
well, in 2017, I uh, co-founded a co-working space and um, here in the Oklahoma City metro area. And that process helped me meet a lot of people in the community here in Oklahoma City. Um, I'm thankful that, you know, people um, in our area, both in Tulsa and Oklahoma City, there's kind of communities that you can get involved in and, and find that uh, of people that will help kind of, you know, help you on your journey. And I think it was my first time of just being a small business owner in general. And, um, but I was able to meet a lot of awesome people who were kind of also in the tech scene. I'm a software developer by trade. So that kind of like combination got me into the whole, you know, entrepreneurship and tech um, sort of one-two punch there. Um, and that kind of led me to working for a couple of uh, high growth, you know, startups, venture back startups here uh, in Oklahoma City, and then eventually kind of going on my own as a consultant and co-founder and doing the stuff that I do now. So that's kind of my intro to it. Great. Let me follow up that question. Thank you, Devin. So with your job is, or your work as a, as a software developer, and you're constantly solving problems, did you see that there was a situation in your own life, in your own workflow where you said, you know, it would be great. I need a co-working space to talk to other people while I'm punching out code. Is that how that came about? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, I think, I think the, type of people. So here in Oklahoma City, we have a co-working space that's very, the tech law has actually traditionally had a relationship with Starspace 46. And that kind of both Starspace and Tech Oklahoma kind of evolved out of a group of primarily software developers. So they weren't necessarily entrepreneurs, but they were people who some of them had entrepreneurial kind of ventures that they were working on, but most of them were technologists, purely speaking. And then, and so that kind of market or world or community was already kind of had something going on there. So we really, what we did is we kind of opened up something that's kind of in a more of a suburban area and really targeted towards those people who are really benefiting now, which are those who are, you know, in, in Oklahoma, a lot of us, you know, thankfully um, can kind of afford housing in these other, in these areas. And so like, our co-working space is actually kind of in, it's in Northmore, Oklahoma. And so it's in a kind of a brand new shopping center, a new development type situation. And a lot of our people are a lot, there are some people who like just work from home and they have even well before, you know, COVID hit the world, but um, it's mostly just like freelancers, traditional small business owners, um, real estate investors, those, those types of folks that you might find. Um, so it's really just kind of everyday people who are in the entrepreneurship game. And I kind of like that. It kind of broke me out of the bubble. So That's great to hear because a lot of times, sometimes we, we think of entrepreneurship as, oh, this one person that had this one idea, and then I'm going to go at it alone, or I have to go at it alone. So Patrick, would you mind chiming in and sharing your story about how entrepreneurship has come up in your life? Uh, gladly, but first I figured it out, Devin. I'm a friend of Mateo's. I've been under Rise several times. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, that's I knew yes, I knew yes, that yes. name from someplace. Love Mateo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my entrepreneurship journey came out of um, it was actually pitched to me by somebody else that wanted to hire me, and then I could just kind of skip the middleman. Uh, Hertz, Oklahoma, Hertz rental car has a has a big presence down here, specifically on Northwest Expressway in MacArthur. There's a big Hertz data center down here. And uh, I used to be a big mainframe guy. And uh, we brought a contractor in once to help us install a product. And I have to be really good at that product. And he was like, Patrick, do you want to leave? You know, do you want to leave Hertz and, and come on the road and work for us? And I thought, well, Hadn't even thought about it, but hey, you know, why not? I'd, I'd give that a shot because I'm doing the same thing in the same company all day long and I get bored pretty easily. And so then I kind of got the idea of just kind of going around that particular person to the company that made the software in San Francisco. And I, I pitched them uh, I pitched them something via email. And uh, I think I learned one of my first lessons about pricing, but it kind of came back with a pitch them a, a price because they had asked me. And uh, they came back and said, sure, when can you start? So it was like, can you start yesterday kind of thing? I'm like, oh, okay, 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 okay. I can do this now. And, and that's where it came out of. I really wasn't looking to become an entrepreneur. Somebody had 
floated the idea to me and then uh, it kind of started around in my head and then I said, okay, well, let's go on this all the way. So that's how it came into my life. That's wonderful. And what a difference in that it, it called to you. You weren't looking for it, but it found you some kind of way. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you, Sam. So you're involved in actually several things, but before you got involved in all those things, how did entrepreneurship introduce itself in your life? Well, first of all, thank you and happy wonderful Wednesday, everyone. My journey, my entrepreneurship journey took backflips, zigzags, going up and down. But I feel that my journey with entrepreneurship was inherited from my parents, uh, primarily my mom, uh, because I knew her basically all my life. And I just met my dad recently as I got older. But my mom has pretty much been an entrepreneur for for the most part that I've known. And then my dad, when I found out, he had his own band, which is essentially being your own entrepreneur. And so through that, I've just watched my mom because she's a Haitian immigrant when she came to the United States. You know, I've watched her work in offices, but then I also seen her doing little side hustles, whether it be going to the flea market and reselling things and sending it back to Haiti or just doing any odd jobs that was bringing another source of income. So for me, seeing those kind of uh, different avenues with her kind of built on my entrepreneurship journey to the point that when I was 13 years old, I started working with a handyman, not so much to be an employee, but to kind of gain knowledge from how can I learn from this guy? And then do it myself, because I've always been and always had that mindset that if someone else can do it, I can do it, too. And I've because of that mindset, I always figured that was kind of the entrepreneurial mindset, which led me into high school, started selling candies with one of my best friends. And we seen two guys that were in our high school um, and they were selling candy. My best friend, Matt, we looked at each other and said, if they can do it, we can do it, too. And believe it or not, we did it. Oddly enough, we shut them down and one of them came working for us. So it was, like I said, it's, it's been in, our, in my blood and ultimately one of those journeys and my current venture right now with our project experience is all kudos to my wife because she ultimately pushed me to really strive and said, hey, you know what? You've been in corporate America. You're amazingly talented. Why don't you go out there and do something for yourself? And I never really thought about it that way because although my mom has always been an entrepreneur, she never really pushed entrepreneurship coming from a third world country or as defined as Haiti being a third world country it's always coming to America to find a better opportunity or that American dream going to college getting educated going to work for a big company having retirement and pension but as I went through that I started realizing this is not the track that I actually want to be on and so that's how I ended up just kind of scaling away from corporate America and building my own brand, building my own organization and going in that direction. So for me, my entrepreneurship journey really started with my parents and just watching the risks that they were willing to take and just navigating the space where they're able to just do anything that they set their mind to. That's amazing. Let me just point out um, this wonderful theme that, that the entrepreneurship experience came up organically. And that's what I'm hearing in, in all of your experiences. It's not like you woke up one day and was like, I'm going to own my own business and, and decide to mow everybody over. That in the course of your work, in the manner of life, as you're going about existing and working, that the idea was presented to you in different circumstances. And and I and for those of us who just um, came on a little later, welcome. And if you have questions, don't be afraid to unmute yourself or drop them in the chat and uh, we'll be happy to call on you. We do want you to, to you to have an interactive um, session here with our panelists. So Sam, you mentioned how your wife was um, is really supportive of your your efforts. So let me segue also into a question about support because I, I think that there's this common um, message about entrepreneurship that it's hard and you just have to burn yourself out and, and sacrifice everything. It's almost like an all or nothing game sometimes if, if you're not careful about who you're listening to. So um, Patrick, let me go back to you for a moment. As you were going through that, that your entrepreneurship of, you know, you got that offer and you're like, okay, 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 I can do this. What were you able to, to look around or set up in your life to say, you know what, I, I, I need some people to back me up whether it's mentally or emotionally or spiritually, was there anything that you did or thought about to help you architect a support system for yourself? That's a good question. Cause I don't, I don't really recall having that. I mean, my spouse supported me a hundred percent. 
Uh, my coworkers at Hertz supported me 100% after they got pissed off at me for leaving them with one brilliant staff person lighter. Um, uh, I think the support system primarily came at the time from the other, the, this company, uh, which is Serena Software right out of the San Francisco airport area, had a lot of independent contractors and a lot of us were on the road, but we also communicated a lot. So I think at the time I probably either texted them or called them a lot or every now and then we'd all meet up and do some in-person discussion on you know business development and growth. Uh, and that's probably on the business side where I primarily you know, picked up my support when it came to structuring a business. And I'm sure a lot of people are like this. There was no defined path or orthodox way. There was nothing by the book at all. I've got horror stories of you know, coming up with invoices and business standards and cold hotels and in, in, in the backwoods of Iowa. I mean, just nothing went according to any plan whatsoever. So I think at the time it was just some other fellow entrepreneurs who had started on the same journey that I had, just kind of picking their brain here and there and learned along the way. School of hard knocks. That's definitely the school I came up through. Thank you for that. Uh, D, we see your question. Let's give Devin a chance to answer um, about the support system and then you can go ahead and unmute and then ask. Uh, Devin, can you answer a little bit about um, you know, your support system? I mean, you were already in the community. Did, did that help with your journey? It did, yeah. Um, I would say that as far as like my immediate, just like personal support system, I don't know that I've, I don't know that I've found, I think I've, I've found a lot of people. I mean, people are concerned for your well being, And so taking risks, people are, maybe a little bit more just concerned and it's easy to interpret that as like, you know, they don't really want you to pursue your dreams or whatever it may be. Um, I, I, I find that, you know, as I get older, I kind of interpret that as like, well, this person just really loves me and they're, you know, they, they just really want me to, to just do well in life. Right. Um, so it, you know, you kind of have to like uh, manage that sort of uh, reaction or expectation that you bring to that conversation. But in general, I would say that the um, the community support system was really helpful. And then, um, so after I, I worked for a couple of startups, I went out on my own, actually during COVID, um, and uh, found that I heavily leveraging uh, the Techlahoma community actually was really helpful for me, both on helping source work. I mean, mostly most of what I did was software consulting, and so being able to like find other developers who needed, you know, some hours thrown their way or um, even just finding new clients and then even creating a referral network of people who knew that if they had a client that they needed someone they could trust that they could send them my way. And so I think that um, really for me, it was kind of an intentional out there community based support system that I found um, just because I think uh, the people that the people that I come from were much more a little bit risk averse compared to what what I really wanted to get into. Um, you know, you count the cost being an entrepreneur and knowing that there's risks associated to it. I, th I think that's a really great point how you have people in your life who care about you and they just want it. They want what's best for you. But we can interpret that as resistance or opposition. And sometimes that's not always the case. So I, I love how you were able to get out outside of your head and and have the perspective that these are people that care about me and they just want me to do well, but I'm going to do this anyway. Thanks so much. <laughs> so do you want to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question to Sam? Okay, I can go ahead and ask the question. Um, so Sam, D. Smith had a question. How do you balance being a parent, working, and trying to be an entrepreneur? Schedule, calendar. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a lot. I'll be honest. It, it's it's a fine balance between everything. And one of the reasons why I define myself as a uncommon project manager is because with our project experience, before we start anything, one of the things that we do is give a moment of meditation. Um, the reason why we do that is because ultimately when you're going from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, you're never really having an opportunity to disconnect and reprogram, reboot, and really focus in on what you're planning on doing for that next meeting that you're preparing for. So for me, it's that work-life balance is strict. Work-life, parent, family, wife balance is really important because all those things play a factor. 
um, one of the things that I do is with my wife, I ensure that we definitely have a date night at least once a week, making sure that she has her time with me, making sure that my kids, we have family night that's already scheduled on Fridays, making sure that all three of my kids have that opportunity to have daddy time, going to the gathering place, whatever it may be, at least once a week dedicated for my family. And when it comes to work and being an entrepreneur, you know, I, I ensure that even when there's social events and networking opportunities that I have to be a part of, I make sure that I find a way to make it up to my family if they get sacrificed because that networking event may conflict with a Friday night where it's family night or a date night. Oh, randomly, last night, my wife and I, we just went to a date night right after a networking event. I had to go to this networking event and my wife said, hey, you know what? Let's go ahead and make it a date night. And we just made a date night. We went out grabbed some food and sat down, talk, talked about some things. So really, it's really managing your schedule, making sure that whenever you're putting something on that, that you hold yourself accountable and making sure that you follow through on it. And then ultimately making sure that everyone gives, and even time for yourself, because I talked about everyone, but I didn't even talk about self because you have to have that time as well, because you can give so much, but if you don't fill yourself back up, you won't have enough to give to everyone again. So that's also important, taking time for yourself. But again, Calendly and all those other schedules that are out there, they're really important and crucial. But that's one of the things, uh, tools that I definitely use for making sure that I manage my time for everyone holistically. So can I just ask a quick question? Sam, whenever you say meditation, you legitimately mean like a mindfulness meditation like moment before entering into, that's yeah, awesome. not. Yeah, not not anything deep intrinsic meditation, sure. but just more so just an opportunity. And believe it or not, I have some meditation music playing in the background. I'll meet with a client and we'll literally spend anywhere between seven to 10 minutes just literally decompressing, debriefing and setting our intentions. Because one of the things about meeting with someone, I don't want to meet just to meet. I can't stand it. Like I, I do not want to be on a meeting on a Zoom call just for the sake of it. So when we before we meet, I set our intentions. What are we intending to be here for? You have, you have the agenda, it's outlined. Let's focus on those intentions. And once we're done with our meditations, let's, let's rock, it, rock it hard and move on. I, I really love that. I mean, I think, I think that one of the things we get to do as entrepreneurs is we get to pioneer a new way. We, we get to do business our way instead of the way that it's been done. And I really appreciate that. And I appreciate people who want to do that. Um, I think that clients end up appreciating that as well. And ultimately, I think it's good for the world, right? I mean, business runs our world. So and then the other thing, like for me, whenever I got thrust into sort of the entrepreneurship journey, I felt like I was in a pretty rough spot in life. And I found that the more I grow as a person, the better, the, just the better at business I was. It was almost like those skills kind of came hand in hand. And it wasn't until I, someone put it the, the best way that I've heard recently, I listened to it on a podcast, they said, the beauty of entrepreneurship is that it's a personal growth project and business clothes. And so uh, like, it's like, that's exactly right. Like you can't be a good entrepreneur without just like kind of doing your own work. And I think that's what I'm hearing from you, which I think is super cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'll be honest, I've never had anybody decline not wanting to meditate. So I guess I'm doing something right. <laughs> it's such a unique uh, request and invitation in a, in a meeting. You know, when somebody says, hey, I just want to go ahead and tune in and make sure we're we're all good and aligned. Like I can't, imagine a client going absolutely not we're going to be diametrically opposed for the rest of this meeting and that's the way we're going to do it um i i see the other question and i'll ask that in a moment but i wanted patrick to chime in about personal growth um and and i know that you're a big proponent and a, and a believer in that you're living it out every day uh, can you talk a little bit about the personal growth that you're you've experienced serving in our military thank you for your service by the way and, and speaking to people and how that has really been a, in a pillar in your entrepreneurship journey? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think I started kind of on the journey of, pers journey, uh, the journey of personal growth, but not diction. Um, when I, I just kind of, I really wanted more, I guess, out of my existence on this planet. And so I'm just a huge, uh, a person who's just a big believer in studying and, and constant self-improvement. And, you know, I, I get up early not to be Mr. Hyperproductive. I get up early because it's nice and quiet and peaceful early in the morning. If you can get up before your cats and your dogs wake up, that's a that's a peaceful time right there. Um, 
serving in the military really didn't get me started on personal development so much. That particular journey was just lack of options and wanted to make sure I didn't run the streets of LA. So I made sure and when I was in North Hollywood, I got into something structured as soon as possible or else that's where I really would have ended up. So that kind of, uh, the personal development kind of came more after I went into business, I think back in 1998. Uh, and, and the goal is, is just doing, you know, as much with my time as I'm given as entrepreneurs, uh, Devin made a very good point about defining our, you know, defining our journey and new ways of doing things. But the big thing that we do have control over is, is our time. I can't remember the last time I worked a 40 hour week. I've worked some 20 hour weeks some 30 hour weeks and some 60 hour weeks, but I can't remember the last time I worked a straight up 40 hour week. Um, and so I try to use all of that extra time, whether it's physical development or reading. I mean, you know, behind me, I've got several books. I'm always picking up more books. I picked up a couple of more books when I was in Scottsdale last week, I was talking about that, but just constant consuming of information to make so I can learn it. I'm really big. I'm also really big fan of learning things and making them simpler from someone behind, you know, someone behind me. Uh, I've always liked the phrase, you know, lifting people up on our shoulders. And that's probably a lot of the reason why I do personal development also is just to make it easier for, for the people behind me that to make them realize that like, again, like Devin said, we get to define our own path on ways on things. And I want people to realize that more and more. So that's kind of me rambling right there, but that's what I really get out of personal development is just learning and passing it on. And uh, D Smith actually had a question for you, Patrick. What do you do when tunnel vision starts to set in? That happens to me a lot um, because uh, just, again, being an entrepreneur at home, you can sit here for eight or nine hours and just do nothing. Um, I actually have to go out of my way to interrupt myself, if this makes sense. Um, I have to make sure that I don't spend more than an hour or two on any given thing, um, lest I, I get into tunnel vision and nothing else gets done for the day. So I'm a big fan of using uh, tech tools and things like that to, to basically interrupt me and reminding me to move on. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's set right now. Yeah, it is set. On my Apple Watch, for example, I set like an hour reminder. So if I'm doing something, reading, coding, working in PHP, doing something in WordPress, that something jolts me awake and reminds me to like get up and stand and move and hydrate and eat, or else I will get stuck in tunnel vision. And then as soon as that hour timer hits, I hit go to the, go get something to eat, water, stretch, do whatever, hit reset, and that hour timer starts over. So it's a great question. Uh, like I said, though, I just try to use technology, the technology that I love and hate, to interrupt me and just kind of jolt me out of that tunnel vision. I think that's so interesting that you you get to be the interrupter and and the facilitator of your interruptions at the same time. <laughs> so you can argue with yourself and be like, no, I need 35 more minutes and still lose lose that debate. But you yeah. can also win and say, hey, you can take five minutes uh, with that. Great question, see. And, and Devin, there's a question actually for you. What do you do when you lose sight um, of a press goal? I think you I think that means a pressing goal. How do you get back on track? So Devin, that's for you. Yeah, press goal. Um, I think from a day-to-day -day perspective, a lot of what I do is, you know, it's all kind of deadline based. And so for me that it's in the software development world, there's a lot of like structure and methodology around like getting that, you know, done, uh, getting, you know, making deadlines, getting something out there to the, to, to the user. I, I think, I think the way that I kind of make sure to stay, I guess, more or less on track is to make sure that um, whatever it is, whenever that time comes, that there's something of value uh, delivered. Um, I think it's easy to be like, this is the thing we set out to do. Therefore, that's the thing I have to deliver some way. For me, I think it's like, well, what does value look like at this current stage of a particular project? Um, a lot of times, especially towards the latter part of a project, you have to just, you just have to make your commits. And I think for me, it's, it's a matter of like the, uh, really, really what, what Patrick said was like kind of the day-to-day -day time management, right? Like making sure that for all the uh, hours that you're spending in a day on projects that you're in, investing that in a productive way i there's nothing worse than and i hate this or just like working on something and just spinning my wheels on it and not feel like i'm getting anywhere with it um and, and that means i think for me that looks like 
getting up and walking, you know, um, meditation to set intention during the day, just because I think it's like super powerful for my brain. Um, but then also whenever I am entering into that fifth gear of just like super productivity of like protecting that, um, I think things like, like, Hey, you know, so for me, I'm not a night owl. So it's like, Hey, I need to get this stuff done. I'm going to be waking up at like three 34 in the morning or whatever to like get up and, and get this done because that time is valuable. I know that I won't get interrupted during that time. I know that I don't have other needs pressing me for that time, that kind of thing. I think that that's like those practical decisions of just finding what works for you to be the most productive pound for pound or minute for minute. That is powerful. And I think what's great about being able to take on projects and, and call the shots is you get to define what's early and what's late. Right. And so what's early to somebody else could be late to someone else, you know, 3 a.m. might be late to me, but it's but it's perfect for you. And 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 I think there's there's something powerful in that. Diana, we actually have a question for you. And the question is, what is the common obstacle that you had to overcome and how did you do that? Oh, for me as an entrepreneur. Yes. <sighs> Myself. Yes, my own, I feel like I am my own biggest obstacle. I tend to overthink everything and stress out over things, uh, procrastinate, um, and I'm constantly having to kind of bring myself back and recenter myself and um, set aside time to sit down and just do things versus thinking myself out of them, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And with with all the projects and programs that that you're involved in, it it would I think it would surprise people if they knew that you did struggle with procrastination or overthinking or doubting yourself and serious anxiety. <laughs> right. And this actually leads me to my next question. And I think I'll, I'll have uh, Sam start this one off is what is something that you find yourself struggling with? that other people might be surprised that that's something that you struggle with. Confidence. <laughs> honestly, uh, honestly it's, it's confidence. Um, one of the things that I struggled with a lot, especially with, because uh, I'm in the service industry, I'm a project management blockchain consultant and things like that, is we're in a different era with technology where you have to be the face and the brand of your organization. And because of that, I didn't like being in front of camera. My marketing team couldn't stand me because they were just like, hey man, I need content. Like people need to see you. People need to know and value who you are. You can give them tons of information, but if they don't truly believe and see the person that's bringing that worth and bringing that value and being value added, you're never really gonna get anywhere. You can put all the quotes out there, you can put all the tools out there, but if you're not in front of that camera, if you're not doing those reels on Instagram, if you're not doing the TikTok videos, if you're not doing any of those things, you're not gonna gain attraction. And so I really had to break out of that mold of not being in front of the camera and just jumping in there and just doing it. Um, I've just never really been comfortable with being in front of the camera, but when I am in front of it, I just have a great time with it. But yeah, that's one of the things. It's just more so confidence with content building and just doing videos. Uh, I just never really liked to care for it. But now I realize that's just the way in the world that we're living in right now, especially like right now, right? <laughs> I don't like being in front of the camera. I don't even like looking at myself, but guess what? I have to do it. This is, a, this is an opportunity to get my brand out there, get recognition. So these are the things that we have to do in this new wave of technology that we're using right now. And it's gonna be more interesting as the metaverse rolls around, but I won't even get into that conversation right now. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're glad you have your camera on and immersion <laughs> Immersion is, is definitely a gateway to mastery. Um, Patrick, what is something that you struggle with that we might be surprised is actually a challenge for you? Uh, well, probably a particular, I mean, I live in the world of marketing, but just, a lot of the follow-up that probably comes with marketing. I'm not a fan of just sitting down and doing follow-up emails all day long. Uh, whenever I do it, it generates business, but you think, hey, Patrick, you're the you're one of the marketing guys. You should be eating and breathing this stuff. No, I've 
I'm learning the older that I get, and I would bet money I'm probably the oldest one on this stream right now, that um, I get I get bored and I dread typing. Um, I like cameras. I like talking. I would much rather use my voice and my camera than anything else. No disrespect to Sam there. It's just my, it's just the way I am now. Like I work with a team that's uh, all over the country uh, for a particular company. And I noticed when I joined this team that they, yeah, they do emails like everybody else, but they're big fans of Voxer, V-O-X-E-R. And just all day long, we're exchanging voice messages because when I have to get a thought out, like replying to something as you were setting up this up, as we were replying to something, um, you know, me typing up like a resume or a CV or something like that, or just answering a simple question, Patrick, when can you be on? Um, I would much rather pick up my phone and talk for 30 seconds than I would be typing on email. So any kind of textual communication, uh, I really dread doing. And so oftentimes I have like overdue tasks in my CRM. I use HubSpot a lot. I have overdue tasks in my CRM because I know that task is me writing up a long email. Oh, can't stand that stuff. It's good to know. So even even the simple tasks can be a challenge just because we don't we don't necessarily prefer it. Devina, I'll have you answer that question about something that you may struggle with that we may be surprised it is a challenge to you. But let me piggyback that as well. And you can answer both questions because Dee has this question. How do you keep up with the times to keep your business relevant? Yeah. Um, something, something that I actually historically struggle with a lot, and, and this I think is really, really part and parcel with my story as an entrepreneur is, um, I, I am by nature extremely, uh, non-confrontational and pretty shy in general. And, um, I think that I remember one time that I was trying to apply for an internship just because I needed a gig in, in college and it was for a kind of like business heavy um, sort of uh, office uh, at, at the University of Oklahoma. And I remember going in and, and just the, it was a fairly intense interview. And I remember just emailing back afterwards and being like, ah, this isn't for me. <laughs> like it was just too high pressure, like, you know, not, not for me. And then, you, you know, you fast forward, you know, 12 or so years and it's like, now I feel pretty confident to walk into most situations and just kind of take command over the things that I'm expected to, right? So the, like technology or like developing a product, the things that I feel confident in now. And I think really all that has come from just getting in and trying it. I, I, I think I'm naturally attracted to what I call infinite games. That's not my term, but just like games that can't be won. I'm not interested in games that are just win or lose and super finite. Um, I'm super interested in things that are, that are going to be infinitely interesting to me. Um, and business is one product development is, is one, um, you know, the, the, the challenge of creating awesome, awesome software for folks and awesome technology. The, those are in innovation in general, those are infinite games. And I think that those are really interesting to me. So in general, I think like what I'm struggling with right now is like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm most, I'm learning kind of, I'm just now learning how to do that as me and not every entrepreneur is cut from the same cloth. You know, I'm not a salesy person. I'm not, I don't really like content building. I like writing. Actually, I'm the very, I'm the exact opposite of these two guys. I think, I think I love writing. I love written content, but it takes so much thought work and that kind of stuff that I've never had time in my position to actually do that. And now I'm transitioning kind of back into the workforce. Uh, and I see that almost as kind of like, I don't know, almost as like an entrepreneurial failure. Trust me, I still have other side gigs and other companies that I'm still involved with, involved in, but it's like, those are the, those are the types of things that I'm struggling with now. And I think it kind of boils into this idea that like, I'm just not the typical entrepreneur from like a stereotypical like perspective. And so that kind of gives like um, a self-consciousness that I, that I wrestle with at times. We really appreciate you being candid in that way. And I think it's, it, all three of you are, are bringing this multidimensional um, experience with entrepreneurship, you know, having to be your own secretary and marketer and publicist um, and your own analyst. And it's okay to feel like I'm not very good at these other things, but I have to try anyway. 
I also really appreciate how you're, you're telling your story, how you were back then isn't the way that you are now, because you've gone through these experiences, you went through the tense moments, you had some wins and, and continue learning through that, which leads me to my next question. And I'm gonna um, kick this up to Sam. What is one thing that you wish you knew when you first started? Take social media more serious. <laughs> I did not expect, I mean, cause I, I literally, at the college, I started a cleaning business and I had some really, I had two doctor's offices I was cleaning. Mind you, this is after college and I was still working for a hospital at the same time and had a, a, a tremendous opportunity where I could have really blown up my cleaning business, but I was still programming that mindset of going to work. Um, through that matriculation of, and I'm grateful for everything that the Department of Veteran Affairs has done for me during that time period. But when I was truly back into that swing of being an entrepreneur, I didn't really take Facebook that serious. I thought it was just somewhere where you know, just played around, network, connected with people that you haven't seen forever, high school people that you're like, who, where do I remember you from? And they're friending you. Um, but I didn't keep up with the times with seeing the, the, the elevation between Instagram and now TikTok and all the other social media platforms. Cause I really saw it as, you know what, this is gonna be another MySpace. It's gonna die off and then we're gonna have something else that comes up. But seeing now, and, and, now, and it's just also changing the mindset because you can live or die on Facebook as well if you're kind of focused on using that as your sole marketing source as well. So it's really just my biggest thing that I struggled with is just really kind of finding what's that one technology that's going to help you get to the next level. And, you know, now I'm just like, hey, I'm all in on everything. Anything that someone tells me, a new app that's out there, I'm signing up and I'm checking it out because now you just don't know. I mean, there's so many different apps. There's so much technology out there that you can use that's going to enhance and make your business, make you more efficient that you don't want to miss that opportunity where you can be a better entrepreneur and ultimately a better person by taking heed of those new technologies that are out there. So I wish I would have done my, more due diligence with being out there, you know, taking advantage and opportunities with Facebook and all the other social media platforms. But again, it's not a wish. It's just something I know I would have been in a different trajectory had I taken that opportunity and taken those strides with focusing on social media a little bit more. That's a, that's a great answer. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm with you on that of like, you know, I slept on the whole social media thing because at the time, and I'm dating myself, but the marketing experts were like, you can't measure the ROI on it, you know, but yes, you can. So Dee, I hope that kind of answers your question about asking, how do you keep up with the time to keep your business relevant? And what we can extract from Sam's answer is that, you know, you just want to stay fresh and, and that you want to be open to the new things that are coming out that might seem like a novelty at the time or you know when it first comes out but it's okay i mean if you if you can try it and experience it for yourself you may be able to leverage that in in different ways to keep your business relevant and um, one Patrick, more thing if you don't mind yes. one more thing i add on to that cuz you just triggered something for me when you said stay fresh um i used to live in puerto rico and I remember the owner of the restaurant that I used to live above, he had an Italian restaurant. His wife was Puerto Rican, he was Italian. I remember walking into his restaurant and literally he was changing up the whole layout of his restaurant, reupholstering the, 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 the chairs, the benches. And I, was, and I asked him, I said, John Carlo, why are you doing this? He said, man, I have my regulars and then I have tourists but I have to keep it fresh. If I don't keep it fresh, people are going to forget about me and they're going to go to all the other slew of restaurants that they have options for right on this strip. So that was one of the things that as soon as you said, keep it fresh, it kind of triggered that for me. So yeah, keeping it fresh, you got to keep it fresh. And I think what I also want to point out is that there is a difference between keeping your business relevant to your industry and your market, and then keeping it relevant to you. Like, does it still matter to you the way that it did from when you started? And, and that may change. Um, Patrick, I'll, I'll pass the question over to you with um, how, how do you keep, keep up with, your, with the times? I think I learn it's such a cliche, but I literally learn enough just to be dangerous, to know what things are and know how to talk about them. 
Um, I know what NFTs are. I know what Bitcoin is. I'm going to have a Patrick Bitcoin or stop doing bit, nothing Bitcoin someday. I can see Sam over there rubbing his hands. He's going to have a conversation offline about this. But I know what NFTs are and, and all the latest things, I pretty much know what they are. And I, the reason I say I know them just enough to be dangerous is because I want to know inside of my head what's hype and what's, what's going to be hype and what's not going to be hype. You know, people are just going crazy when it comes to investing in certain things. And some of these things are are legitimate futures and have, you know, real useful applications. And some of these things, when I see people investing, I, I had a conversation on Facebook like this with someone the other day. I mean, you're investing like me going to a craps table and throwing dice is investing is what it is. You know, investing is I have a traditional old school sense of what investing is, something that will gain in value and, and bring value to the market and may provide something for someone in the future and in turn help a company grow. I don't go to the craps table to invest. I go to the craps table to, to, to have a good time. And so I like to know which technologies are gonna be a, a good, uh, are gonna be for a good time and which ones actually have a, a, a valid future. So I just dabble a little bit of everything. On my Mac recently, I started the, the Facebook Spark Augmented Reality Studio, and I've been playing a little bit in augmented reality now, so I could do stuff like uh, make make uh, objects and text follow my hands, follow my eyes, put wings on my back, all that stuff. I'm not going to become an expert in it, but I think it has a great future. Augmented reality does, uh, as do, as you know, does, does Bitcoin. But there are some things coming up that are just just hype, and so I would really like to know separating this stuff from hype. Uh, from from good stuff, and there's another reason, somewhat self-serving, or to serve you guys as a society, is oftentimes um, the the I, I I as in the pre-show here, we were talking about me being on the news. I get called by all the local TV stations, uh, KFOR, Fox, uh, Channel Five, and um, Channel Nine, and oftentimes they'll have a news story about some tech and something that like some teenager has done bad with some tech. And they'll call and they'll say, Patrick, come over to the station and let's talk about why this is a good or a bad thing. I'm like, okay, let me install that. And as I drive over, I will tell you why it's a good thing and bad thing. So I kid you not, they'll call me about something. And I know I can learn about a piece of tech in like 10, 15 minutes, uh, but I'll do that. I'll install the app and say, okay, that's a bad thing. Get in my car and I'll drive over to the TV station and talk about it. Uh, and oftentimes, um, so, so, Educating the public, I guess, is what I'm putting out there is I need to know some of this stuff so I can talk about it intelligently and tell parents uh, whether or not it's good or bad. Um, uh, there's a part of the there was a website once that um, a bunch of credit cards were leaked on. And I really can't think of the name of the website that's going to come to me. But it's like one of those underground websites you do not want people to go to. And um, I was doing a news story and I was telling this reporter uh, it may have been Bobby Miller at Channel 9 about um, how, how this is where all this credit card stuff lives. And I was talking to her offline about it. And she's like, well, on the news, should we tell people to go to this website? Should we tell parents to go to this website? I'm like, no, 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 no. You do not want to tell people on the TV station to go to that website. And when I think about what it is, I'll put it, I'll put it in the comments. And, and Devin and Sam will probably be like, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. You do not want people going there. So um, so that's a very long answer to a very quick question. To educate the public and to educate myself so I know the difference between hype and no hype. That's awesome. And, and I also want to point out how uh, there's this theme of exercising your curiosity, like your personal curiosity. Just, just to, you know, we have to give ourselves a little bit of tinker time. With, with things that are unfamiliar and we have to experience it for ourselves in order to talk about it. Devin, I'm gonna kick the question back to you. Well, um, what is one thing that you wish you knew when you first started? Uh, yeah, I think um, the thing that I wish I knew, and, and I think there's an interesting ambiguity in the word new. Um, I, it's one of those things that like you could, I could go back and I could tell my, you know, 20 year old self like this thing, but they, old Devin has to burn his hand on the stove before it really matters to him. Um, but the thing that I wish I did kind of know is that it's okay, that, that everyone is pioneering their own path and it's okay to pioneer your own path and for that to look you. There is no sort of, and so this is, you know, to kind of, we were quipping a little bit in the in the comments about the stereotypical entrepreneur. I think it was easy for me to have this 
vision of what that was, what an entrepreneur is supposed to be, or what, you know, certain categories of people were supposed to be in general. And the reality is that life doesn't work that way. And therefore business doesn't work that way. And so whenever you're going into business and creating businesses and creating value in the world, you, you are doing it in a really unique way because it's coming out directly of, of, out of who you are. Um, you know, so kind of the flip side of that coin that we were talking about, about it being a personal growth project earlier is that you, you know, it, it is what you make it and there's a room in the world for that. So. There's a place for everyone and there's a, there's a time for everything, all the feelings, all the mistakes, all the imaginations. And, and that's, I think that's what's wonderful about the entrepreneurship journey. Let me pause for a moment and give our attendees a chance to just take a breath. We've been shooting a lot of experiences and a lot of information back and forth. It's been awesome. But if you have a question or you're curious about something, please, please, please unmute. I'm going to be silent for a record of 10 seconds to let you uh, give you a chance to do that. Giovanni, ah. Uh, do you want to do you want to go ahead and read it or do you want me to read it? Oh yes. Is there see? Oh Grace. You mind if I chime in? Yeah. Um come on, girl. <laughs> so uh I'm a student right now, um graduating from a two-year program in about six months. And I have a lot of um people encouraging me to go to like a, a traditional corporate route, which I'm not averse to, um, but discouraging me uh, from pursuing entrepreneurship because of the potential for failure. Um, so I would appreciate um, as encouragement or even a similar version, if, it, if so be it, um, if you could describe for me like the hardest time that you've had and, and what resources you used to come back from that or just go through it. Yeah, I heard uh, Patrick going to the school of hard knocks. Maybe you got a story. <laughs> oh, you want to go ahead and haul? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, there, there, um, so one of the stories that I don't talk about too often is uh, when I was uh, starting my entrepreneur journey, the, the company that I want to do some work for, uh, they were they started in Sacramento, and so even though I was a contractor, uh, they still wanted me to fly out and interview, and um, so I flew out, uh, met up with an old Air Force buddy who happened to be in the same city, and we went out to eat, and then I think I went back to my hotel room, and I I think it's the only time I can recall having the equivalent of like a panic attack. Um, I was laying on my bed in the hotel in Sacramento, and I was just I. I had kind of come to the full realization of what I had done. And once I got over that, um, uh, I think that was probably a, a low point for me that, that I, I just had to kind of figure it out. Um, it's definitely not, you know, it's definitely not the route for everybody. And there will be other times where you'll have things like that, like panic attacks, where, where your, your, your invoices, there's a big gap between when invoices are going to be paid and and when the rent is due kind of things and uh the the thing probably the one advice i could give you there is that most people in this world um if they've ever been any kind of entrepreneur they're very forgiving for the mistakes that you'll make along the way um you know someone like uh if, if you have rent due you know your landlord who owns real estate he himself or she herself is an entrepreneur they know how income and expenses work and they're going to be very they're probably going to be pretty forgiving because they get it so i would tell you that number one you're going to have you know panic attacks but number two to surround yourself in your support system whether it's dealing with your finances or personal development of you know other entrepreneurs who have had rough times because they're going to get it and they're going to be very understanding um a lot of um nothing not going to throw any hate or any shade on w2 people but a lot of w2 people just don't get it um when it comes to the difference between you know oh direct deposit you know what first and 15th every single month never ever late no sometimes my paychecks have been on the third and the 19th or the fourth and the the sixth with nothing until the next fourth um so just yeah uh, good support system is all i can recommend to you and i can guarantee you any of the people here on this zoom would be glad to 
have coffee with you. Look at that right there in the chat and uh, and help me out. If that helps, let me know if that helps. I have no idea because I ramble. Thank you. I think this also uh, piggybacks on, on the question, Giovanni, that you had. No worries, I got you. Uh, is there a new aspect of yourself that you discovered while being an entrepreneur? I'll kick this off to Sam and then Devin. Yeah, I would say the new aspect of myself that I learned was just being able to overcome. So I'm going to answer that question and also answer Grace's question because going through and being an entrepreneur, you're going to, you're going to fail. You know, no one, anybody that ever tells you that they did it right the first time and had that perfect blueprint, I promise you is lying or just not being honest, you know, because honestly, you have to look at yourself first. Um, going back to what Patrick said, you have to ask yourself, are you someone that chooses to live a comfortable life? You don't want to push yourself to any limits. You, you're just fine with getting that constant, consistent paycheck, storing it into a 401k, whatever kind of investments that you wanted. If that's the type of person you are, I recommend, hey, don't go down this route of entrepreneurship because it is, it's a, it's a true struggle. And one of the things that I learned was my own struggle. Uh, full transparency, I was uh, a, a chief operating officer of a farm in Florida and gave two years to this farm and walked away with nothing. I literally lifted this farm from nothing. It didn't have a Facebook page. I, well, I'm sorry, it didn't have an Instagram or a real major presence, presence on social media. I dive into a world that I knew nothing about, hydroponic farming. And so I learned that, got better than the master farmer that was there. And ultimately, because of a handshake agreement, which I learned now that you don't do those things, um, because of that handshake agreement, I almost lost two years of my life. And at that point, um, I, I didn't have anything. I, I literally liquidated everything that I had at that time, you know, sacrificed the livelihood of my family, that I was my wife and three kids. And just because of this vision of being an entrepreneur and seeing an opportunity that was there and even neglected other support systems that were there. I had friends that were already entrepreneurs and were asking me to help manage a lot of projects that they were on. But I seen this as this gold nugget and saying, oh, you know what? I see the vision with this farm. I see the opportunities that were there. And yet, you know, I sacrificed and I lost a lot. But in that loss, I didn't lose anything. It was a true gain because I learned so many valuable lessons. I learned how, you know, to market. I learned how to speak to people. I learned how who I am as a person and how do I how do I handle adversity? I learned what was my threshold of BS. And that's what really allowed me to be able to walk away because it got to the point where I seen so much money leaving and I didn't see where those re where our revenue was coming in. And I it just I meet I reach, reach my ceiling. And so therefore you learn a lot about yourself when you go through that entrepreneur pathway because it it's it's work. It's work and you got to find ways to balance everything out mentally, physically, emotionally. There's a lot that you're investing in, but there's so much freedom that's along with that route in entrepreneurship. And I'll tell you that anybody can do it, but you have to define who you are first before you go down that path of being an entrepreneur. So I know you, I have no doubts, Grace, that you can do anything in this world. But the first thing I'd ask you to just really sit down and ask yourself, who am I? And what do I want to give to this world? That's awesome. And, I, and Grace, I hope that encouraged you and, and inspired oh, you in some Yeah, practice. thank you, Sam. I mean, I've had a conversation with you before and it's always been enlightening. Um, thank you. And I think what we've seen in the journeys with entrepreneurship is you can have as little or as much as you want. You know, it's not this big chunk that you have to swallow all at one time. You, you can actually parcel it out for yourself. Um, so, so Devin, I'll have you answer that question. Is there a new aspect of yourself that you discovered while being an entrepreneur? And then um, it, it's been so much fun. We are a little short on time, but after you answer the question, Devin, we'll, we will wrap up. Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely a lot that I've learned about myself. And the thing that I would point to is um, that I believe I have been able to see in the rearview mirror what my motivations kind of truly are. Um, I think that it's easy to jump into anything and, and kind of in your brain say, hey, this is why I want to do this, but then have some other, what's really driving you. I mean, I'm a big believer, like we're really not that rational as creatures go, like we think that we are, but we're not. Um, 
And so you just have to understand that like you're a human being that has their limitations. And um, I do think that advice for young entrepreneurs, get out there and try things. You never know. Like um, I think that it's that even if you are going into the workforce, like, Hey, like try different things. Don't get stuck. Don't use all of your twenties and thirties at the same company. Like, honestly, I would not advise that in today's world. Um, uh, at max, you know, spend five years, something like that at max, if you're going in that world and for young entrepreneurs, like, Hey, just, you have to figure out that you, you do not know yourself near as well as you think you do. And that is also going to change. So not only are you trying to figure yourself out, but it's also a moving target. And so know that going into it, you're figuring out a lot about yourself, a lot about what you want. And then as you reveal those motivations, like that helps you. Like for me, what I did is I was just like, Hey, look, I realized that I got myself in this lot of situations that I really didn't like. And it was kind of one of the situations like I needed to realize that, that I had gotten myself into that because of a motivation of title or prestige or being able to just say, Hey, because of this, I was an entrepreneur, cool, whatever. But reality is, is like, I just really love like learning and playing what I said earlier, this infinite game. And, and also bringing value to folks in a unique way and entrepreneurship allows you to do that. So that is part of that personal journey part of it. Um, and so uh, it's, it's certainly worth doing, but again, it's a, it's, a, it's a bumpy road, just like all these other guys have said, and you just have to be really, really self-aware and mindful jumping into it. Thank you so much. We do have one final question from Giovanni, but Devin, I'll, I'll let you take this one since you did say something about being non-confrontational. So. How do you resolve conflict within your team? Uh, Simon Sinek uh, did, he, he piggy, he, sorry, I'm, I'm answering Grace's question actually. Uh, but uh, she asked if, if, if uh, Simon Sinek, if I got an infinite game from Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek got that term from a philosopher named James Cars. I actually have a philosophy degree. So um, James Cars uh, uh, has a book called Finite and Infinite Games. It's really confusing if you read it, but it's one of those that the more you think about it, the more awesome it is. So I highly recommend it. and also recommend Simon Sinek. So um, conflict and just in general, I think like dealing with clients and dealing with team members and all that kind of stuff. For me, I think that one of the things you have to realize uh, in this journey of personal growth and entrepreneurship is that the, the, the weakness that you have can also be your greatest strength. So the thing that makes me a people pleaser and non-confrontational also allows me to be an extremely effective diplomat. Um, and so I'm able to pull people together really well and bring people to the table in a way that I think people who are more of kind of like a bulldozer or more of like just a sheer willpower type leader, those leaders, they have their, they have their place in, in business. But um, I think, I think the, the truth is that any way you resolve any conflict is know the know the incentives involved and to to figure out a way that you personally you you enter into that conversation in a personal way that's unique to you and figure out how to do that that's going to take some experimentation but you know it, it is what it is just like all things in life you have to practice right so wonderful if any of our attendees want to connect with um all or either of you, Patrick, where's, where can they find you? Uh, PatrickAllman.com, stopdoingnothing.com, and I'm Patrick Allman all over the internet. So uh, uh, track me down, I'd love to connect with you. I've had a pretty heavy presence on Twitter, um, but I, I can pretty much be found any place. I'm not even sure that's a good thing. And that's Almond with two L's, by the way. Yes, exactly. That's a little bit of a unique spelling there, Almond with two L's. Yes, and Sam, where can people find you? You can find me at rprojectexperience.com and on social media handles is rprojectexp and I'm available on all social media platforms, including Discord. Including Discord. <laughs> yes. And Devin, I see that you um, dropped your site um, and Techlahoma Slack. Yes. And I, and I believe you can find any and all of us on Techlahoma Slack. Um, so we're going to wrap up this time. We're a little bit over, but the nuggets of wisdom and the vulnerability and experience that you have all shared has been so appreciated. Um, I know it's helped me a lot. And for those listening, I, I hope so as well. And, and so to wrap up, thank you again to our panelists for sharing your expertise and your experience and being so truthful about your life. 
Thank you, Diana, for, for having us um, on here. And thank you to all of you who joined us. So whether you're a student who's considering starting a business or a seasoned professional and you feel like, man, it's just time that I'm gonna launch on my own, the time to do it is now. Stay connected with us either on LinkedIn or the Techlahoma Slack. And if you wanna connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn as well or in Techlahoma Slack and I am Mahalo Ramos. Thank you so much. And thank you for this wonderful session for Global Entrepreneurship Week. Good night. Thanks for hosting. Good night. Thank you.